So very great welcome to my next panel. Uh, we have a really interesting bunch of people doing all kinds of different real-world applications of blockchain. On my left, we have Anastasia Andrianova. She's the founder and CEO of Acropolis Decentralized. She's going to be looking at reforming pensions infrastructure. We have John Monarch, who's the founder of ShipChain. He's a logistics background. He's looking at how blockchain can revolutionize the supply chain. Then we have Nick martin yuk who's the co-founder and CEO of WePower Network. I hope I said that correctly in terms of pronouncing your name, uh, looking at how we can trade energy more efficiently and effectively. And last but my no means least, on the end we have Roger Henney, who's the co-founder and CEO of Datum Foundation, who's looking at how we can use blockchain to better manage big data, which is probably one of the big questions of our current internet era. So, delighted to welcome all the panel. I'm going to ask them each to just do a quick intro of themselves, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what the applications are they're working on and really how blockchain helps uh, to address existing business problems that couldn't be solved before, but maybe the properties of blockchain are allowing us to now solve those entrenched problems in new ways. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Anastasia first. Is it working? Hello. Yes. Hi. It works. Uh, hi, thanks, Helen. Um, my name is Anna. My background uh, is in private equity and fund management. Uh, we started looking at um, the pension sector and specifically at how things can be improved um, in February this year, through my work uh, with two large um, pension schemes. Um, somebody who's been on the buy side for um, most of my career, it was very apparent to me that um, the use case is just absolutely obvious. Um, the, uh, the removal of the necessary costs, the transparency and ultimately the ability to, uh, to empower individuals, to, to empower users by removing a whole range of intermediaries was something that appealed straight away. And that um, really was a trigger from to start looking into um, our technology and starting uh, developing a concept. Thank you. Thank you. Was it, was it hard to move from sort of traditional finance into the blockchain world? Because you had a career previously in... in financial services, you know, a nice job, nice paycheck, and now you're in this startup land where everything's a bit more risky? Um, I've always had high, high appetite for, uh, for risk. I'm fully committed to the sector right now. Um, yeah. Basically, all my time is devoted to the blockchain sector. Um, ultimately, it's all about, yeah, we have finite presence here, right? You know, yeah. You can either choose to make a difference or you can stay in a safe job. Um, I mean, for me, the choice was clear. It'd be boring if we did the same thing forever, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I'm not for boring, no. And ultimately, it's a huge problem that um, nobody's addressing right now. Uh, the solution is impossible in the confines of the current system. I mean, the mathematics simply doesn't add up. Um, I find myself in a situation where um, I could talk to the boards of pension funds, to the executive chairman of pension funds about uh, the concerns, the issues, and at the same time, um, it's clear that the younger, the younger generation, millennials plus, simply have no trust in the system. You know, there's no desire to participate in it. Um, so what, uh, what was very obvious to me is that a new solution um, has, to be, has to be engineered, and I focused on bringing together the smartest people from the blockchain universe, I'm from the finance community to start working on that. Thank you so much. Thank John, you. I mean, when it comes to shipping and logistics, the supply chain is one of the sort of best use cases that people say for blockchain, and since it ticks all the boxes of what a good use case for the blockchain is. So how do you find sort of quite traditional industry like shipping and, and freight comes to view blockchain as a newcomer on the block? They really see it as a, a very strong up-and-coming technology. Uh, it's a very old industry is some of the problems with it, though. Um, so you have some pushback a little bit from the industry in general, uh, being a nearly $10 trillion a year industry globally and uh, about 10% of the United States GDP. Uh, but at the same time, you have most people are very interested in looking at it from a, a perspective of this is going to solve all of the, not all of, but many of the largest problems that the industry faces, including uh, visibility into track and trace, uh, custody problems, and things of that nature. And um, we talked a little bit yesterday, just over dinner, about the, the customs issue, also that there's a lot of paperwork and um, regulatory kind of 
bump involved in shipping and logistics. So is that something that you're also looking into? It is, and involving the regulators in the process with shipping and logistics is very important, especially in this blockchain uh, world. So involving regulators in that, giving them access to private keys to shipments that require their, uh, their, their approval, uh, certain things that are dangerous goods, things that are crossing borders uh, and of that nature. And turning to Nick, um, I mean, the energy sector is one area where maybe proof of concepts in blockchain is sort of advancing faster than some other sectors. So tell us more about what you're doing and how you think blockchain is changing the game in the marketplace. So us and our team, uh, we are in energy business for a long time. So I'm developing renewable energy projects for the past 10 years. And uh, the team uh, that joined us uh, on this uh, WePower project is basically, uh, they've been in energy business, but on the side of the development of energy grids um, also around 10 years. So energy business today, it's shifting. It's becoming more decentralized in, uh, in such a way that we started to use more renewable energy. Uh, and uh, this means the change is happening to how energy is produced. We have less of uh, traditional energy capacities now that we're producing energy out of steam and we're switching to 100% renewable, renewable energy. So this is the long goal to, for everybody to become as uh, carbon neutral as possible, but it involves uh, changing the way how we produce energy and how uh, it is being uh, delivered to people. So uh, while working and developing renewable, renewable energy projects, especially for the past uh, year and a half, uh, the investment in the sector has dropped a bit. Uh, it happened because we have less subsidies. On, on one side, it's a good thing that uh, subsidies are going away and uh, we can compete uh, in an open market. But at the same time, uh, we need more financing to, um, to develop more projects. And uh, it is logical that because we are, all of us are the end users of energy, why not buy directly from the producer? So what our platform allows people to do is basically to invest directly in the project they like and uh, buy energy from it and the energy will be delivered to you. If we're not in the country where you're buying, um, let's say, smart contract from, um, then you can basically sell it on the, on the marketplace and uh, somebody else uh, will, will get the energy. This is the way a decentralized system works and it's been uh, it's becoming more and more applicable so energy is a hard business it's also a very old business and uh, it's really hard to change it so the first way how to change it and optimize it is basically bring the transaction volumes up this is the first thing we're trying to build so there will be enough transactions to actually enable the peer-to-peer -peer trading between people so you'll have both a kind of consumer application but also a, a kind of enterprise are you aiming at business-to-business -business market and consumer market? Yeah, so basically anybody can, uh, can buy energy. So we are working in the very beginning with big energy developers to bring the volumes up. Uh, anybody um, can buy this energy. It can be a person, it can be you, everybody, or a big company that is consuming a lot of energy. So what, uh, how it is done is that you're basically able to um, buy energy directly from the consumer at a cheaper price in such a way giving him financing to construct the plant and when it's there the energy will be delivered to you okay. thank you and roger finally on the end of the row sorry to leave you till last but um i'm interested to hear how you think blockchain can help us managing the problem of big data yeah, so um, we are building a decentralized database for structured data. Um, and the problem we're tackling is that um, many of these large companies, Google, Facebook, Uber, Equifax, are building these large data silos. And they're very bad at actually safeguarding your data. So Uber just made an announcement a few weeks ago. They lost 57 million um, user records. Equifax lost 143 million every second Americans' uh, personal data. And the problem is that this data is not uh, encrypted uh, individually to you. So um, what we're doing with Datum is providing this data storage infrastructure where each of your personal data records are encrypted with your own private key. And we use a technology called uh, proxy re-encryption, which allows to sh uh, safely share and sell this data. Um, so the network can basically transform the encrypted data, but never decrypt it um, itself. 
And so what we're really aiming to do is um, help individuals claim back their data ownership. Um, so we actually built a calculator. You can go to uh, calc.datum.org. And we looked at 25 uh, popular online services and how much um, they're actually making of your data. And the figure we came up to is about 2,000 US dollars a month. And you can read on, on our methodology um, on our website. And so uh, we are proposing a solution where developers can basically securely store your personal data, still have delegated access, but you're ultimately in control of this data. And um, so in the European Union next year, they're introducing something called GDPR. It's a new legislation that returns some rights to uh, individuals, for example, the right to have your data deleted. But we really uh, are proposing a solution that goes a step further. With Datum, you're really the actual owner of that data. And um, we think that's, that's uh, the future. Yeah, it's a fundamental point. Also, when it comes to healthcare, we don't have a healthcare person on the panel, but there are a lot of people working in the healthcare sector on how to improve ownership of healthcare data so that we can all hopefully be owners of our own healthcare information, or at least share healthcare information among professionals, which would improve the quality of care. So I'm sort of interested to know what level of evolution your projects are all at. I mean, maybe we can go back down this way for fairness. So since we're into both fair and distributed systems, um, where have you got to in terms of where your projects got to and funding and, and rolling it out? Um, yeah, so we just uh, finished our fundraising. Um, and so before Christmas, we're launching the first real um, data trade. So we've built a pretty large community of crypto enthusiasts. And we're basically allowing them to, for the first time, sell their personal data. So we're starting with a use case where they can sell their email. We won't give their email out, but we'll allow other companies that are interested to reach out to our community to, to reach those users. Um, and the users are rewarded, um, are earning our tokens in, in reward for that. And so this really empowers for the first time the individuals to actually start making money of, of what is theirs. That's one of the reasons I like real world examples, because it gets people interested. You know, if you talk to people about blockchain in, in sort of theoretical terms, you know, my kids sort of say to me, oh, blockchain, 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 like, why are you going on about blockchain? You know, but then you say to somebody, oh, well, you could monetize your own data and not give it away to search engines or social media sites, or you can own your own healthcare data, or you can trade your excess energy from your solar panels. People start to get really interested in what the real world applications actually mean. So. I'm glad to hear that you're starting to be able to roll that out. Turn to you, Nick. Yeah, so um, on our side, we've built um, a minimum viable product uh, some time ago. We're still in the fundraising process. We have a partnership with the transmission systems operator, which uh, operates the smart grid today. And it's uh, one of the couple f fully built uh, smart grids in the world. Uh, so it gives us a great opportunity to test out what uh, we want to build. Um, after that, we're moving to uh, the, our first target market, which is, is Spain. Uh, we have a pipeline uh, of projects there with our partners. Uh, this will allow us to test everything, um, how the platform works before scaling up the product. So we're in our early stages still. We have uh, tracking and tracing on smart contracts. Uh, we have a pilot partnership with Purdue Farms. They're about a nine to ten billion dollar a year company in the United States and around the world uh, that does agricultural business, chicken, grain, things like that. So a lot of their headaches have been around the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act in the United States, which has recently been uh, becoming much more strict on a lot of these companies. So what they need is to have that availability of a unified tracking system to show, uh, including an IoT type of setup where okay, it was this temperature in the trailer, it stored this goods prior, uh, and we know exactly every bit of information that came from that shipment. Uh, so we start that partnership with them in January and are going to be working on their internal fleet of uh, trucks and rail cars as well. Exciting times for you then. Um, Anastasia? So well, the, we, uh, we started, uh, the concept was, uh, was developed in August. Um, we've uh, done an angel uh, round um, so I, I combined the equity round with uh, or the token round um, from a few strategic investors. Um, we are finalizing our uh, POC and alpha right now um, and in talks with uh, several funds regarding the seed round. Yeah. And what do the panel think are the key kind of implementation challenges? Because and one of the problems for startups is always, you know, to get the first customer 
you know, once you've got one customer, you can get two. Once you've got two, you can get four, and so on, and it spirals out. But getting that first customer when you're working in a cutting edge technology where people don't really either understand what you do, so first you have to educate your customer that they actually want what you're trying to sell them, and then you have to actually close the deal. So how do people manage that, and, and what are the other kind of implement challenges you see coming down the pike other than just growing the company, but the, the practical challenges of implementing blockchain projects? So I'll take that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, so on our side, uh, the focus is twofold: um, is this individual user base, um, so people, and the institutional user base. For the institutions, um, the, the engagement process is very much through uh, through talks, through workshops, through discussions. They have to see it's very important to maintain uh, the development of uh, the individual user solution, uh, simply because it's only through seeing that they can be disintimidated, that institutions will actually sit up and listen. Um, so uh, yes, outreach, education, workshops is a very, very big part of that. Uh, and ultimately, um, designing an exceptionally user-friendly product uh, is um, a huge part of our focus. Um, and as I'm sure everybody in this room is aware, you know, good UX, UI is, you know, is worth its money in, in multiple times over, especially in crypto. And you know the the thing you show doesn't necessarily even have to work, right? So I I, I went to a workshop once mm. about a real-world implementation yes. of a multi-party blockchain project, and they said, you know, we created a sort of app. It wasn't really real and didn't really work, but it looked like the end product that we were planning to create. Yeah, just a muckle. Yeah, and that's what sold mm. the project that yeah. was, people can see, you know, something on their smartphone exactly. that they could use, even if it works or not. But they get the idea. I agree. It's it's very important to move from from a level of abstraction to showing something. And yeah, it can be just... Yeah, so de demonstration projects of whatever kind. Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's something we're working on right now. John? So we have a very unique implementation uh, challenges from both aspects, but we have to take both a top-down and bottom-up approach to this, simply because from the top-down perspective, you have to look at these major corporations, these fleet owners, these retailers, producers, uh, manufacturers, etc. Uh, but the bottom-up approach, and we're looking at, of course, multimodal, so everything from air, ocean, uh, rail, trucking. But there's a lot of independent actors in the ecosystem. So for instance, in the United States alone, trucking is an $800 billion a year industry. There are 350,000 independent owner-operators that own their vehicles and drive as an independent company uh, out of a total 4 million truckers in the U.S. So these people basically set their own business, and you have to work with them to uh, to actually make them want to join the ecosystem as well. So that's where we're looking at uh, a rewards program for these drivers and these stakeholders in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you have kind of advocates and evangelists in your community, you don't have to then do all the education yourself. You're also building a wider community that can educate others and spread the whole project out. Exactly, and word spreads very quickly among this uh, these, uh, these drivers, so it's very helpful. They have to do something while they're driving, right? They chat to each other. <laughs> Nick. So, um, as I mentioned before, energy is a very old business. So, in, uh, to do well here, you have to uh, engage the companies that are operating the distribution systems and transmission systems. Um, in our case, we decided to go this way straight away. Uh, we partnered with a transmission systems operator that has a very good infrastructure already in place. And uh, because our, we not only want to solve the, the problem of the renewable energy sector, but we want to make it a scalable solution to work in more or less every country in the world. So um, systems operate in a similar way. They have some nuances uh, in one country to another, but uh, the principles are there for a very long time and they stay, stay constant. So we partnered up uh, with an uh, Estonian company and started working on uh, how we can not only um, work on the solution, what we provide to the customers that uh, want to buy cheaper green energy and um, develop more renewable energy projects, but also how can we help the, the grid to do this transition from 24% uh, renewable energy today to 100% in the future. So it requires uh, work with them, and if you don't partner with them, basically, it will be a very limited implementation. You could work out the microgrids, uh, that will work fine in small communities, but if you want to provide uh, a big, robust solution for, uh, for the future, you have to partner uh, up with them. And uh, in our case, we started working with one, and now uh, more and more companies approach us to, uh, to start working on the solution that can be impl implemented with other distribution and transmission systems operators as well. Mm. 
So in your industry, it's partly about kind of intra-industry partnership building and, and collaboration and also creating some kind of standards maybe for allowing people to use your platform and to work together. Yeah, you have to, it's, it's, for many years, it was a very close business energy. And uh, only now it's opening up. Uh, it started opening up because decentralization, decentralization started to happen and there are uh, small, small power plants from, uh, let's say, uh, 30 kilowatt uh, or 5 kilowatt on a house to a big power plant uh, grid scale of 50 megawatts somewhere um, in the field. Uh, the partners that we have uh, in Spain now, they um, are developing a pipeline of uh, 1 gigawatt, which would in Spain, for example, would power uh, 450,000 households for a year. So um, if you want to uh, build a big solution, you have to work directly with them and build the partnerships to have them in place so the, implement the, the project that you're working on it could be very great that the, you'll have a chance to implement it fully. And Roger, in terms of your um, data solutions, I mean, you talked about GDPR, which was interesting. So there's various regulations in different countries about what data can be held about you. And in some senses, that might even drive a market for you, you know, because blockchain might be a good solution to the problem of that type of regulation, because it's very hard for companies at the moment to actually manage how to implement things like the GDPR regulations. Yeah, so, so first of all, for us, um, there are some real-world um, problems. And, and we try to make a mass-market solution, and usability is um, really key. Uh, but just a very simple example, for a user to get onboarded, if, if the user needs to call a smart contract function in your, in your Ethereum uh, token or contract, he basically needs to have Ethereum. He needs to pay the transaction cost uh, in gas. And um, so it's not really feasible to, at the moment, expect the mass market customer to go out there and get himself some Ethereum, right? Fiat to crypto is still pretty broken. Um, so there's some fundamental problems like that. There's um, transactions per second on Ethereum. It's, it's really not very fast. And there's various blockchains um, that propose faster transactions, but some of them are, are sacrificing decentralization, so they're adding some centralized elements. Um, and so. I think that really brings me to this big point. Um, if you use blockchain, the reason to decentralize must really be the most critical aspect of the whole system because blockchain is actually a kind of horrible development environment. You can do everything almost much better on a centralized system. So if there is really no reason, um, no super important aspect why you need to have a decentralized systems, users will simply not want to put up with the usability shortcomings that, that we currently have. And um, so yeah, I look forward to the next year and see you know, what Ethereum comes up with and which of these alternative blockchains um, become mature enough and which ones find a real decentralized solution to scaling transactions, um, for example. So it's amazing. Everyone's identified a different problem. So we should always be really nice to people running startups because they're not just trying to run a business. They're also trying to educate people, build a community, build industry standards, deal with technical problems, you know, a whole host of other challenges that go around building up a company in such a kind of cutting edge new technology. We have about five or six minutes for questions, so I'd love to get a few questions from the floor. I'm gonna try and take one from this side, because I think I favored this side earlier on. So if someone has a question over this side of the room, then feel free. I think someone's standing up there looking for a mic. Be interesting also to hear people's views on what other industries are moving ahead fast in terms of real world applications, because we have just a few examples here, but there are also other industries that are now starting to move forward. So f feel free to comment on that as well as part of the Q&A. Do we have a mic coming? Please have me mic. If you uh, can say where you're from as well, that would be great. Hi, I'm uh, Gangadhar, working for a startup in India. Um, and I have a question for John. Uh, I'm not sure if you were, I, I'm not sure if I misheard you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your product gives access to the customs officials for uh, the private keys of the shipments. I didn't really understand how that works. Um, why would they need the private keys and how, how that works in your, uh, in your product flow? So the information such as the bill of lading will be stored actually within the smart contract. Uh, any sort of information that might be pertinent for those customs officials to have, such as uh, you know, the, the HST classification for import tariffs, the, uh, what the good is itself, if there's any sort of toxic you know, paperwork that needs to be filed and things of that nature to just streamline the paperwork, essentially. 
Next question. Looking for hands up. Can you see any hands up? I can't see anyone. Wait. Oh, yeah, at the back there, lady in the white top. This is for uh, oh, Matt, Nicola. Sorry. Nicola. Long hair. Um, just out of curiosity, are you, are you f experiencing where you're at now? Are you getting more pushback from the renewable industry energy sector or from the fossil fuel energy sector? Well, I wouldn't say that there's a push against renewables anymore. Um, there, will, there will always be a conflict for, uh, for a period of time, but uh, those countries that already uh, can produce renewable energy at the market price, um, they're competing very heavily with uh, traditional uh, power. Uh, in some countries, you can actually produce uh, renewables much cheaper than uh, um, electricity or heat from gas. So um, there might be a push uh, from their side to the, uh, to the governments uh, not to allow more uh, renewables energy, renewable energy. But everybody understands that from a financial point of view, you already cannot stop it. And uh, it's, if you are in a country where you can produce uh, cheaper energy from solar, from wind and hydro, uh, you'll definitely go that way. And um, the old system will, uh, they will, it will be there for some time to support uh, the development of renewables as well, but um, it will go away eventually. Anyone else? I think there's one at the back in the middle there. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Faisal Chowdhury. I'm from um, Bangladesh, and I have a question regarding um, the system implementation itself. Um, Given that the technology is really dependent on the, um, on the computing power, etc., can you see a scenario when the whole system can collapse? It's a question to me. Um, well, I mean, some chains are moving to proof of stake that reduces the energy consumption. Um, but it's an interesting point. Um, I forgot the exact number, but there was some comparison how much um, electricity is actually used by uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum at the moment, and it's pretty excessive if, if you think what is being uh, done with it. Um, so, so no, I don't think it will collapse. Um, so moving to proof of stake um, yeah, reduces energy consumption, and I'm sure there's going to be other solutions in the future. I think for the last question, I'm going to take the moderator's privilege and just ask each of the panelists to mention a sector that's not already been mentioned where they think there's some interesting real-world applications of blockchain going on um, outside of the ones we've already had on the panel. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that, Anastasia? Any particular sector you see sort of moving ahead? I mean, healthcare is very interesting, but huge issues. Yeah. Just absolutely enormous issues. Management of data in healthcare is, yeah, is very controversial. But absolutely. And this is where... The data is very interesting, and with um, GDPR coming in, it's, it's just a layer of um, privacy and data challenges. But um, yeah. I mean, naturally, both governments sector. and um, patients are nervous about the idea of, of giving up ownership of their data or sharing their data in the correct way with the correct permissions. Yeah, to be honest, I think a lot of the battle has been lost already. I mean, especially both from the UK, if you know what's happening with the NHS. Well, we won't even get into the NHS, otherwise we'll have to have another whole no. day of conferences. <laughs> what about you, John? Do you see other sectors moving ahead? Uh, one, th there's a couple, actually, I really like to see. And one is in oil and gas, so not just for like energy, but things like that, but tracking everything from well to refinery to the IoT play of figuring out you know, how much was produced, paraffins and things like that, but also mining uh, and making sure that you know, you're not mining conflict minerals in a certain area and that... Uh, these, con you know, these conflict minerals aren't making it into a supply chain. Well, I would say, you know, it's, um, as you mentioned, basically, uh, there are some solutions that are, are better solved with um, centralized dat databases, and uh, you cannot solve everything with uh, uh, blockchain here. Um, applications uh, like healthcare, they're very important and interesting, but uh, some... Uh, Additional technology has to be uh, has to be developed fully for people to trust it, and uh, uh, we perfectly understand that uh, we want to control our data. And if I'm uh, 
um, giving the information to one doctor. I, I want to keep it private and uh, give access to only when I wish to do it. So basically, the, the information, pri privacy is the first thing uh, I would like to be delivered to, to the end. Yeah, I think managing a lot of different bilateral relationships, doctor to patient, doctor to doctor, you know, doctor to insurer, there's a lot of different relationships that would have to be managed in that system. And Roger, finally. Yeah, um, so for me, it's actually the integration of all these thousands of tokens. I think that's key to real-world um, usage next year, and um, that requires a few key components. It requires decentralized exchanges. It requires things like MetaMask, but maybe in an even more usable way. Um, and, and that's what I'm looking forward next year to see, you know, can this problem be solved? How can we bring all these tokens together? Because realistically, none of us is going to use 100 tokens to do different things next year. So tokens really are probably going to work in the background in a transparent way, and we need to have interfaces that are on a higher stack on the front end to bring all of this together and exchange tokens as seamlessly across projects. Well, that's a great point, and thank you for making it, because it leads into my final panel of the day. So I'm going to come back to that later on in the afternoon when we go on to the panel about trading and investing in ICOs. But thank you so much to all of my panel. Um, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, I'm sure they're going to be around for the rest of the afternoon. So just falls to me to thank Anastasia, John, Nick, and Roger for an excellent discussion. And thank all of you for your excellent questions as well.